Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marissa Tonelli from Health HIV. I'm the Senior Capacity Building Manager for our 3D Data Decisions Delivery Program. Um, and I'm very excited to invite you all here today and uh, introduce some really great speakers that we have um, from both the National Academy for State Health Policy, the Core Center, and also the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, and today we're presenting a webinar together on data delivery and decisions as levers for enhancing whole person care for people living with HIV um, and presenting specifically lessons learned from the Ruth M. Rothstein Core Center, which is in Chicago, Illinois. Um, we will be recording this webinar today and posting it online. Um, but if you are having any audio issues, um, if you notice the announcement below, you may switch to your phone icon. Um, it tends to be a little bit more reliable, um, and that's at the bottom left hand of your screen uh, to switch to audio. If you're having any other technical difficulties, feel free to chat us in the chat box or call our main line at Health HIV, um, and the number is below. So Health HIV, just to give you a quick introduction, has four core capabilities. We do capacity building and technical assistance, advocacy, health services research and evaluation, and education and training. Um, and we have a very diverse staff that's working in both HIV, hepatitis C, and LGBT health, um, and work with numerous partners, um, including NASHP, who is working on this webinar with us today. Um, within our capacity building programs, we work with a variety of different audiences. These are just a few of them. Um, our ASO CBO capacity building, health department capacity building, I'm sorry, that skipped, uh, workforce, patient-centered HIV care model, which is working with pharmacists. Um, as well as work with health center capacity building. And as I mentioned today, our uh, presentation today is uh, supported by our 3D HIV prevention technical assistance program. So the 3D HIV prevention program uh, works to facilitate community infrastructure development and systems coordination that ensure sustainability of HIV services. Um, expand care team integration through partnership development, including those with non-clinical HIV prevention partners and clinical partners. Demonstrate cost effectiveness and outcomes monitoring of programs to maximize strengths and efficiencies and impact health outcomes. And also promote workforce development, including training the next generation of leaders in HIV prevention. Today, uh, currently, you have access to the PowerPoint slide deck. Board, sorry. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner of your webinar screen, right under the 3D HIV prevention icon, there is a folder. Uh, you can download a PDF of the PowerPoint slides from that uh, folder right now today of the slides. Um, you can also access them on Health HIV's website along with the webinar recording and any Q&A um, that occurs today. Um, and the website address is here. We'll post that again for you all. Um, but you can go to Health HIV's main website uh, within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. The recording slide deck and Q&A will be available. Um, today we'll also be utilizing instant polling, um, uh, potentially if presenters are interested in, in the chat box. Um, so feel free to utilize any of these uh, activities and interactive uh, pieces of our Webinato platform. Um, the chat box is at the bottom left. I see you already are utilizing that. Please feel free to chat questions to the presenters, chat questions to facilitators, um, any technical difficulties, et cetera. Um, feel free to utilize the chat box or any of that as we go through our webinar today. Um, so with that, I'd love to introduce um, our facilitator from the National Academy for State Health Policy, Chiara Corso, um, and she's going to kick off this webinar, introduce our next speakers, um, and uh, provide a little bit of an overview of NASHP and uh, their work that they've been doing in state health policy. So Chiara, um, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you to Health HIV for supporting this webinar and making it possible. Um, as Marissa said, my name is Chiara Corso. I'm a research analyst at NASHB, the National Academy for State Health Policy. And before we get started today, I'd like to introduce some of our speakers. 
Um, so you've already heard from Marissa and I. You'll also be hearing from Carmen Sanchez, who is the Women's Correctional Health Services Administrator, and Rebecca Goldberg, who is a nurse, nurse clinician. Both of them are at the Ruth M. Rothstein Core Center, which is the focus of our webinar today. And they'll be giving us a, a look at the clinical and systems level of the Core Center. Uh, we'll also have Eduardo Alvarado, who is the Chief of the HIV AIDS Section of the Illinois Department of Public Health, on here today to speak about um, their partnership and work at the state level. I'd also like to give a little bit of background about NASHP, the National Academy for State Health Policy. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We work with state health policymakers across agencies providing technical assistance, research, policy analysis, learning opportunities, and other activities to promote excellence in state health policy. Um, we have a group of academy members who are selected by their peers and they guide our work and decide where our work is going, what we'll look at, and how we can best serve the states that we work with. And we have two offices, one in Portland, Maine, Nash P. North, and one in Washington, D.C. Um, this webinar is accompanied by a case study that my colleague John Transvalli and I are writing um, to showcase the Core Center's best practices. Uh, we decided to focus on the Core Center because they're the largest provider of HIV care in the Midwest, um, and we really wanted to showcase and highlight their one-stop shopping care model um, we think this is a model that is very applicable to many states um, and is definitely worth learning more about and spreading best practices from. Uh, we're also working with the state of Illinois and the HIV Health, Affinity, Health Improvement Affinity Group, which is uh, an affinity group supported by a number of federal agencies, including the CDC, HRSA, and CMS, and Nashville collaborates with them to provide technical assistance to this group of states, and we're excited to talk about where their work is taking them next in this uh, population's health. And um, our case study ties in with the 3D prevention program that Marissa was speaking about before. So we're focusing on data delivery and programmatic decisions. The case study itself is still in the process of being published, but ultimately it'll be available on Nashby's website, www.nashby.org, and we'll be happy to share it via email with today's webinar participants. And with that, I will now hand things over to Carmen Sanchez and Rebecca uh, Goldberg from the Core Center. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. Greetings, everyone. And especially, I want to thank Health, HIV, and Nash P for this opportunity to highlight the Core Center. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so, starting with what we, where we began from, uh, the Core Center actually opened in 1998 as the Core Center. Uh, it was different from the start. Um, it, it's a joint venture really between the public and the private, between the Cook County Bureau of Health Services and Rush University. So um, that collaboration, again, to have the public and the private within one entity to, in a combined space, really, you know, it was thinking outside the box. Um, the Core Center is operated as part of the Cook County Health and Hospital System. It was renamed the Ruth Rosting Core Center in 2009. Uh, Ruth was a nationally recognized public health activist. She lived by the conviction that health care is a right and not a privilege, and that it's the institution's responsibility, um, you know, to the community to provide the services. Uh, she was a legend in Chicago, really, very dynamic. She was a tough advocate. Uh, she actually spearheaded the construction of Stroger Hospital and then uh, was behind the creation of our core center. Uh, so the mission of the Core Center, you know, there are th these are lofty goals. Hopefully, um, through this presentation, we'll show how they are materialized, um, how they're manifested. Um, the idea was to provide the highest quality care for people with infectious diseases, including HIV, with respect, dignity, and compassion, without regard to the ability to pay. Uh, also, to ensure a patient-centered and consumer-guided environment and also through research and education to seek to better understand and prevent these diseases. Okay, so, you know, as was mentioned, we are the largest HIV clinic in the Midwest. We're one of the large, five largest in the country. Uh, we provide a lot of care, uh, and this is data from 2016, uh, almost 18,000 primary care visits to 4,300 people living with um, AIDS and HIV. 
Um, just as important as this next bullet point, that we also provided 13,600 specialty care visits. So then we, you know, bring in the concept of the comprehensive aspect of the care that we offer. And we also have um, a walk-in clinic where um, we saw 11,000, had 11,000 visits uh, last year. Um, through the hospital, um, there, we have a pop-up system when someone is admitted to the hospital where uh, the question is raised whether this person has had an HIV test. So that often um, spurs the provider to order more tests, to do more testing. And in the last year, it was more than 50,000 uh, HIV tests that we provided. Um, maybe some of you remember back in the day, you know, when we, people did not have ready access to health care, as they've been able to have now through the Affordable Care Act, where they would present to the emergency room several times with uh, um, infectious, you know, um, opportunistic infections before we finally diagnosed them. So this is with the idea of diagnosing people sooner and getting into care sooner. So, you know, before I speak about all the services we provide, I really should tell you something else about the, the clientele that we have. Uh, most of our patients are at or below the poverty level. They're dealing with multiple issues that could really potentially get in the way of their care. Uh, when I speak with nursing students, I often bring up Maslow's hierarchy. Many of you probably remember that in your studies. Remember where the bottom level was safety and security, and unless you could get past that bottom level, you couldn't become, as Maslow described, self-actualized and fully come into being. Well, you know, so many of our patients, you know, have issues, uh, 30 to 40 percent have behavioral health diagnoses, 30 percent either have an active or history of chemical dependency, uh, and we have just as many that are co-infected with hepatitis C, about 30 percent of our clients. Uh, our clients might have issues, they definitely will have issues, uh, most of them, with housing and food insecurity. They might have issues with domestic violence. Frankly, many times our clients may have issues with all of the above. Now, having said that, I can tell you that um, of our patients in care, 87% have a viral load less than 200. So those are really good numbers considering all the, the obstacles that our patients face, you know, before they would make their health care priority. We know that nationally, of the people in, in care uh, in, in the United States, only 25 to 30 percent of them have a viral load less than 200. And in the city of Chicago, does better. Um, people in care with a viral load less than 200 is about 48 percent. So here we're at 87 percent. So uh, we seem to be doing well with this, this model. So the idea, you know, is to provide one-stop shopping, as was mentioned earlier. And we know that this provides not only the best outcome, it's going to be the most cost-effective, and for the client, it's going to be the most convenient uh, way for our patients to access the care that they need. So within our clinic, we have several clinics within a clinic. Uh, it includes adult and women primary care. Um, one of the aspects I really appreciate, though, about CORE is that, you know, the clients are always, their input is always very important. It could be through surveys that we do on a regular basis. It could be through our peer program where our peer advocates step up and speak um, very vocally, uh, not only inside CORE, but actually at the national level as well, I'm happy to say. Um, but so all these clinics are fashioned specifically for that group. For example, uh, the women's primary care clinic has, also has pediatric um, care involved at the same time uh, as a component of the clinic so that when, um, when a mom brings her baby in, even though the baby is not positive, the baby can get well baby care at the same time as the mom. So we know moms will get access for their baby. They'll take care of their children before they'll take care of themselves. So of course this promotes a better outcome for the mom as well as the baby. Um, adolescent clinic I find unique for many reasons. You know, uh, we worry so much, I do as a nurse, about the adolescent population because of so many reasons. You know, for one thing, their, their stage of growth and development dictates, you know, they say they want to be different than their peers, but they have a strong 
need to feel an affinity and a connection, right, with their group. So something like HIV and frequently something like gender status, um, sexual orientation, these and HIV make them feel ostracized and um, not as in, apt to engage in care. So in the adolescent clinic, it doesn't start at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, adolescents don't do that well with early appointments. So the clinic starts later in the day. Uh, they're given an appointment date. We don't worry about the time because we don't want them to think that if they miss their appointment, their scheduled slot, that they might as well forget it. We want them to come into care. Uh, often when they do come into the clinic after they sign in, there's an ongoing support group so they can talk with people much the same as themselves and feel an identity with a group uh, that is struggling with the same issues and, and the support is really, of course, invaluable. Um, I like to think of our um, continuity of care clinic as the adult side of the adolescent clinic because uh, continuity of care is for people that have recently been released from jails with an HIV diagnosis. And much like the adolescent clinic, the clients that go to that one are at higher risk at falling through the cracks. So they need a, a smaller, more nurturing clinic. Uh, they have the same provider that saw them in jail, sees them here, and there's some overlap with case management as well. So there's your continuity where people are familiar here. Um, and there's more support with, uh, you know, mental health, um, chemical dependency issues, and they're kept in this smaller, more nurturing clinic until they're ready, you know, to go into a larger adult clinic. Um, so we also have other specialty clinics, uh, such as neurology. Um, it's very important. Uh, we have a lot of our patients have neurological issues. Uh, could be forgetfulness to dementia or not. You know, it could be other issues like ataxias, um, peripheral neuropathy, that would bring them to that clinic. 64% um, of our patients are African American, and we know that they tend to have more issues with kidney uh, disease. So we have a neuro uh, nephrologist here on site every week that sees clients as well for those issues. So that it's all contained within this building. Uh, we offer infusion therapy. We give chemo to patients. Um, with cancers related to HIV, like lymphomas and Kaposi sarcoma. Um, frankly, you know, what is, we all know is happening is happily our patients are aging along with their general population, so the, the issues that they often have mirror what's happening in the general population. So we have a lot of smokers, you know, if they have lung cancer, colon cancer, for issues such as that, we send them over to Stroger Hospital. But for these other manageable cancers related to um, HIV, we can deal with them here. Uh, we have a strong, um, 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 I'm sorry, let me go back a little bit. A strong dental clinic as well. Um, preventive care is given, cleanings as well as whatever care that is needed. Um, hepatitis clinic. Um, is really, um, to me, it's close to my heart uh, because, as I said earlier, about 30% of our patients are co-infected with hepatitis C. So now that we have a cure for, for hepatitis, uh, we know that it's most life-threatening in people that have another virus as well, such as HIV. So um, um, we'll talk further about the collaboration that enabled that to become um, such a big uh, clinic that we have now to expand uh, to a second clinic. So in, additional, uh, in addition to our weekly Thursday clinic, we're also adding Wednesday clinics so that we can treat more patients. Uh, so we'll talk about that more, I think, uh, a little bit uh, later. Uh, psychiatry, of course, chemical dependency, we have all, these, all this support here, a nutrition person here as well. Then there's supportive services layered on top of that. Um, again, mental health is very important. Chemical dependency support is a big part of what we do here. We have strong benefits. Of course, it's important to um, link into whatever um, benefits our clients um, should have, you know, are um, amenable to or, or uh, should be offered to them so that we can um, minimize, hopefully, the, the cost to the county and, and uh, give them comprehensive care. Um, okay, so let's go on a little bit. Uh, funding, as you can see, uh, for the uh, core center, 
the total operating budget is about $20 million per year. Um, Cook County provides over half of CORE's operating budget. Um, you know, you can see the federal funding part below um, the breakdown with the parts A, B, C, and D. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to Carmen. Hi, this is Carmen Sanchez. So uh, the data infrastructure and sharing, we start with Cerner. Cerner is our electronic um, medical records here, which the whole bureau could follow up patients wherever they're at in terms of whatever's going on with them. So, you know, for social service staff, they uh, document under, um, you know, social work, and then you have the medical staff under HIV output. So there's a, a, a electronic paper trail so that we could keep up with what's going on with the clients, where they're at, so that they're, it, easily we could facilitate who's the social worker, who's the uh, psychiatrist, who's the medical doctors. That's so important for clients that have issues with forgetfulness or they can't keep track in terms of what's going on with them. And then also so that we could communicate back and forth in terms of what's going on with them. Uh, Careware is pretty much basically uh, data entry. What did we do with the client face-to-face? -face? Did we give them any incentives? Um, what type of uh, appointment did we have? What do we do for them? That's crucial because it gives us a sense of what's going on, and then also it shows us pattern-wise of what we're seeing when clients come in and clients are asking for a particular uh, service. What seems to be the most, from a social service standpoint, that clients are, are uh, needing, i.e. transportation, food vouchers, et cetera. Then there's PROVIDE. It's uh, uh, under the Illinois Department of Public Health. We're funded under AIDS Foundation of Chicago. So we enter information, including the service plan, uh, under PROVIDE. And for those non-PROVIDE uh, data entry folks, we uh, also enter our information clearly under Cerner. Then there's WebCM. I added WebCM because uh, this goes with the um, DOORS, Department of Rehabilitation Services. These are the sickest of the sickest clients here in which we provide in-home services. So there's an electronic uh, record so that we could document what we're doing, what type of services we're entering in the home, the safety issue, which is a big deal, uh, medication adherence, which is in every single conversation, along with the other uh, folks that we document. But these are the folks that are medically complex, have several issues at hand. We document under... Um, WebCM um, uh, records, and also under Cerner, so it's in two places. Programmatic decisions? Uh, so um, the peer educators and peer support are crucial to us. They are our ears. They literally physically walk the patient, a new patient, throughout the whole building. They greet them downstairs on the first floor. It's a four store uh, four floors um, here at the core center. And then uh, social services, um, we encompass everything in here, in here. So we have our benefits department, which could start people on public aid and also on food entitlements. We also have um, um, internally um, folks coming in, like Social Security, they come in once a week. We had legal counsel, which comes in several times a week, and also they send folks with um, that could meet the needs of that particular clinic, i.e., the bilingual clinic. The bilingual clinic is those that are monolingual Spanish-speaking, so they send an attorney that can't talk to them um, in their native language to so talk about the particulars of that community and that, that community needs. Uh, working with outside entities, we have a DCFS, our child welfare system. We have a liaison. She comes in once a month. We meet with them. We talk about high risk, how we could reduce um, getting them in that system or actually meeting the demands to remove them out of that system if that's uh, the goal of that particular uh, family member, whether it's male, female, et cetera. Um, Midwest AIDS Training and Education, AIDS Foundation of Chicago, that's crucial because 
We consistently train all our social service staff through that format uh, from an external entity, and then internally we do our specifics in terms of the case managers, social workers, for their particular um, areas of uh, coverage, i.e. if they're uh, uh, dealing with pregnant women, the adolescent case managers, uh, the bilingual case managers, everyone gets trained equally the same, but then we focus once they're trained equally the same on their particular specialty so that those individuals know the particular needs of that clinic and they're ready and prepared to actually meet the needs of those, those particular clients. Um, Cost-effective uh, initiatives. Students are really welcome here. We always have students from every venue, medical students, nursing students, social work, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they are our eyes and ears because they bring in what's going on from an educational piece to the core center, and we are preparing the next generation of folks going into social work, going into social service, and then also uh, keeping them abreast of, yes, we want to help, yes, you got into this particular discipline for a reason, but then we also have to pay our bills, i.e., we have to do the benefits, i.e., we have to... Uh, um, apply for ADAP, AIDS Drug Assistance Program. So our, our role is to try to prepare them as best as we can. And again, uh, from a cost effective is some of those students do get higher, both mental health and from case management, because once we train them, they're ready to go. If they decide to apply and there's an opening, we will take on those students. Um, closing thoughts, some of the lessons learned is um, um, basically one-stop shopping. You can encompass so much on a one-stop shopping. They came in for medical care. We could address any issue, any emergency, both internally and externally, i.e. domestic violence, which is across the street. They come to us or we could send them to them. But within the center, we could actually address so many um, obstacles. Um, literally, when there's a mental health issue internally, there's an on-call um, service. In terms of a basic case management on-call system, and our role is that anybody walking through the doors, their particular needs get met, whether they're scheduled or not. And then also, if it's an issue of getting them engaged back into medical care, that's also addressed, including finding out what kept you from us, which often it has to do, as Becky stated, some of those social issues that need to be addressed. Uh, the multidisciplinary approach, we have what's called a preclinic. Um, every single clinic, we review high-risk patients because we have to target those folks, what's going on, what could we do better with you, what do we need to do to improve that adherence with medication. The doctors, the nurses, every single discipline in there, mental health, case management, whoever gets that patient first helps us out. If it's an issue of case management, yes, we will address it. They will bring them to us and vice versa. And we also have what's called staffings. For those clients that need a little more help or something complex is going on, we do individual staffing so that we could see how better we could service these clients. Sharing information both internally and externally, you know, most of us are a part of committees so that we could actually talk about um, what we've learned or also share what has helped us in terms of uh, uh, assisting these clients or patterns, because there may be patterns going on with the clients. Um, educational, both both internally and externally, we all do presentations, we all share information, we also call uh, to receive information. Sometimes we're just stuck, and when we're stuck, we, our job is to find every single resource that we can that we could better assist the clients, but also uh, looking at it from the perspective of the client's view. We don't want to impose on them. Our job is to keep them in the middle, and it's the wraparound service. We rotate around their particular schedules and needs. An example of that is we have an evening, Tuesday evening clinic. For those that come, can't come during the day, they're in school, they're working, et cetera, then we assess them. If we need to put them in the Tuesday evening clinic, we do.
Oops. Um, again, this is Carmen Sanchez and Becky Goldberg. We thank you for your time. We hope we were helpful in our delivery. And our emails are available. Um, Carmen and Becky, uh, if you are uh, willing and able, I think there's a couple of questions that came up while you were presenting that might be appropriate to answer now. Um, and so I just wanted to pose them before we move on. Um, it looks like Mark M. asked if uh, the core center addresses employment needs. So I was wondering if you could answer that question uh, before you sign off. We, we don't have an employment center here, but uh, a couple things is we use our resources um, for employment, especially for reentry individuals that um, are captured, those from prison and jail. But we employ peers. So clients that have been doing beautifully that wants to be employed, we have a peer program. They go through a series of trainings, and once they're done with that training, they become peers. They are paid employees. And even from that particular um, the peer program, then when there's full-time employment for navigators or for whatever grant that needs other individuals to be employed, yes, we do employ them. We have several on board. And uh, that's how some of them just move up the ranks in terms of uh, full-time staff here. Great. And I think um, there is one more question that um, you might be able to answer before we move on to Eduardo's presentation. Um, it looks like Andre T. asked specifically about ways that you're addressing medication adherence with adolescents specifically. Is there anything in particular that you guys or any tactics or strategies you're using in particular to address that issue for adolescents with HIV? That's a good question. I think the most powerful um, help we have is using um, the peers together, you know, and having the groups of young people together identifying with issues that get in the way of taking their meds and um, you know in talking about you know in facilitating that I think that that is the most powerful um, yeah it's it's a tough population that's for sure I think it's also important that because we have so you know many um, young men who have sex with men or you know GLBTQ groups uh, it's so important to make that group feel a part of the community and that is often done, you know, non-verbally. So, you know, from the front desk clerk to the MA to everyone, um, we have trainings periodically that I think are really important to keep bumping up our game and make sure that um, we're an all-inclusive kind of a place where anyone would like to come. Uh, I think that's really critical as well. Well, and I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, with the two case managers in the clinic, in the adolescent clinic, you know, the phone, just putting a timer on the phone um, so that they get a reminder of when to take the medicine and consistently. Secondly, it's, you know, the provider and the case manager, what seems to be going right when you do take your medicine, i.e., whether it's delivering the medicine to your home versus you picking it up. So uh, it's not a perfect system because, as you know, adolescents are different, but uh, it's finding ways around their uh, schedule so that they can take it because uh, often it has to do with um, they don't want those bottles of medicine so that they know what they're taking. So it's, you know, whether it's a pill box, et cetera, how to strategize. And then for those adolescents that are, quote, couch surfing from house to house to house, how to actually maintain it in your book bag or whatever it is that you're carrying. Great. Thank you uh, so much, guys, uh, both Carmen and Becky. Um, I think we're going to hold the rest of the questions um, till the end, and we can come back to some more specific questions um, and comments that were uh, addressed in the chat box at the end. 
Um, right now, I want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, it's uh, Eduardo Alvarado, who is the HIV AIDS Section Chief for the Office of Health Protection um, at the Illinois Department of Health. Um, he served uh, with the Illinois Department of Health previously in the Office of Women's Health and Family Services as an epidemiologist and public health administrator. Um, he's also been appointed to the IRB and the Fetal Infant Mortality Review and Congenital Syphilis Case Review Team as co-chair um, and has been working in the field of HIV AIDS um, for over 20 years, so is very accomplished um, and experience in the field, um, has a lot of insights to share, and is here today to talk about their engagement with the CORE Center and its model. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Eduardo Alvarado. Thank you all so much for that humbling introduction. I was scrolling through the list of names on the, the webinar, and I'm so thrilled to not only say that I know most of you by name, but have had some wonderful opportunity to connect with you in, in recent uh, times and really work with you. And, and if we haven't, I very much look forward to doing so. Um, so please don't be shy, reach out. Uh, myself, my team, the department, we're always very eager to, to connect with our stakeholders and our friends throughout the state. So with that being said, I am thrilled and honored to be here to talk on behalf of Core Center. CORE has always been a very dear friend of mine, and I mean that uh, philosophically, professionally, intellectually. I've watched their agency evolve even before I lived here in Illinois. I worked for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta for several years and really marveled at uh, what I saw mostly on paper at that point as national best practices that really filtered up to us, made us take pause, made us really pay attention to what this dynamic and incredible facility in Chicago, Illinois was doing. So, you know, I, I really am thrilled to be here. I will be brief and get through these slides so that you have an opportunity to ask our friends at um, Core Center, you know, any additional information you have. So, with that, uh, a little bit about our office. We have been operating since 1987 to address the state's epidemic. We see uh, about 200,000 uh, clients through our prevention services and almost 10,000 clients who are now receiving Ryan White, ADAP, or Chick services. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how we expect those numbers to skyrocket in the, the very near future. And I'm proud to say that we have been longstanding partners of Cook County, their health and hospital system, as well as the core family for many years, really since the beginning of the epidemic. So a little bit about what we look like. We prize ourselves in ensuring that everything that comes out of this section is related to the HIV care continuum in some form or fashion, with the ultimate goal of achieving virologic suppression. And so you can see a landscape, and it depicts all of our respective HIV programs and services that we coordinate or fund and how they pertain to the continuum of care models. So you'll have these at your disposal. You can look at these um, in, in your own time. A little bit about where the department gets its funds from and how we disperse those. You can see the largest part of that is dedicated to Ryan White, ADAP, and care services from our friends at the federal um, HRSA level. We also get a portion from CDC for prevention and surveillance activities, quite a bit from Illinois General, General Revenue Funds, or GRF, as most of you know those. And there's also a small sliver dedicated to our legislative funds that come to us in a variety of uh, forms, whether they are related to ticket sales of the red ribbon lottery scratch tickets or the legislatively mandated um, African American AIDS Response Act. Okay. So a topic that I know is near and dear to everyone, and, and um, especially with the transition, not just that's taken place within Illinois, but recently at the national level. 
so I would be remiss if I didn't at least articulate some points about the state of the state, if you will. We do have a newly enacted General Assembly, which I am hopeful um, that and remaining very optimistic that they will be able to move forward with some type of budget, be it a complete state fiscal year 17 budget, a gap budget, or some type of bridge. So that is still pending at this point. Also pending is union contracts for the state employees. And I, I think it's worth mentioning for all of you who do business with the state, I know that you know, my little universe here is is over HIV and AIDS services, but I think I share this with my brethren within the rest of the public health department, and that is our business policies and procedures have changed and evolved and have done so rapidly. We have a new Grants Accountability and Transparency Act that we are leveraging and navigating through. We have very different procurement processes for how we bill, invoice, and spend our dollars. And there is an evolution in the hiring and the CMS grading process. So I, I leave this by way of saying that we know and we understand and we are sympathetic to the fact that information and directions and guidance to our partners, especially those that do receive some resources for us, is constantly in flux. And we, we understand and we empathize and we are doing our best to try and alleviate a lot of the misinformation and uh, disconnection to information and guidance and we'll continue doing so as new information comes to us. So the main reason we're here today is to really talk about and herald the successes of the Core Center, um, which truly do represent a model of excellence. From day one, CORE has been a pioneer within Chicago's HIV AIDS landscape and a national model of excellence. CORE primarily serves the most vulnerable section of people living with HIV and AIDS, including those living well below the poverty level, those without insurance, those who lack familial and social support structures. CORE Center's commitment to disenfranchised populations is in no way lip service, nor is it born out of self-promotion. Since day one, they have been a leader in services that address the complex, unique, and competing priorities of the medically indigent. Most important, core staff represent us. They look like us, they talk like us, they live like us. They creatively use social media and technology to communicate with their clients. They provide quality, comprehensive, life-extending services to those at risk for or whom are impacted with HIV and AIDS. And they do so with compassion, dignity, respect, and relevance to language, culture, creed, gender, and sexual orientation. The Core Center's mission has been simple and consistent from the beginning, and their evolution of care delivery has been patient-centered before that became the norm within federally qualified health centers and community clinics. Their ambulatory care facilities remain a complement to the Core, and in preparation for um, migrating to the Affordable Care Act, Core tapped into its expertise in patient navigation, peer education, and one-stop shopping to successfully link clients into county care, which was a bridge to ACA, and they did so seamlessly. In an effort to continue to meet the unique and ever-changing needs of their population, they established the Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine Clinic, um, and most recently, the nationally recognized Same Gender Loving um, Clinic as well. In the advent for PrEP for HIV prevention, Core Center did not wait for dedicated state, county, city, or federal resources or guidance. They found a way to make this a critical prevention tool and integral uh, to their service delivery. And one thing I am most proud of in the state's partnership with Core Center is their enthusiasm, commitment, and tenacity to co-lead what really began as a demonstration project to expand hepatitis C treatment following the release of interferon sparing, interferon -sparing curative um, hep C treatments. CORE lend, uh, lent their expertise, their clinical knowledge, and their time and passion to truly sit with us at the state to develop a very simple prior authorization form and screening modality and really work with us to ensure that we were 
removing as many barriers as possible to effectively identifying working clients up through and then treating for hepatitis C. And we look to continue that uh, partnership, you know, for, for years to come. Um, you know, in addition, CORE has expertly tapped into the community and uses peers to educate, navigate, develop, and implement prevention, awareness, and advocacy programs. In fact, CORE has thoughtfully made their peer education program a core tenant of their services. Okay. So continuing in their successes um, and their exemplary practices, they have truly taken an integrated approach to sexual health services extending well beyond HIV, in particular, and again reference the hepatitis C expansion that they have undergone, but really ensuring that the priorities surrounding STI and TB screening care and treatment have not been overlooked. Uh, they are a tremendous leader with respect to research and data-driven program development. Uh, most recent and notable is their HPTN 083 study looking at an injectable option for PrEP, which could really revolutionize administration for those that perhaps don't want to solely rely on, on taking one pill every day. Uh, so more to come on that front. And CORE has also been a tremendous leader in addressing and staying one step ahead of the client's mental health and substance abuse needs. They've invested in research, clinical training, outreach, and program development to address emerging issues such as the opioid epidemic and public health emergencies such as the meningitis and syphilis outbreaks. CORE's community engagement has been extensive, thoughtful, and very successful. And I'm proud to say that IDPH has partnered with them on a CAPAS project focusing on peer shadowing, skills building, and engagement of their community partners, and development of a nationally recognized, robust community health worker program. Core uh, leadership remained very active in city and state integrated HIV prevention and care planning bodies, and have a very active, diverse, and engaging community advisory board. So where does this leave us with respect to future opportunities, not just for IDPH and the core center, but opportunities to really continue, continue to marry our, our skill sets and um, our, strengthen our partnership moving forward in the state, especially in a time of such uncertainty where we all have to ask about the future for HIV services nationwide within Illinois, within Chicago, and ultimately core center. From the federal perspective, we can expect and should expect blended federal notices of funding awards, be they surveillance plus prevention or care plus prevention. And I think these ultimately will, will really help us achieve more of our metrics moving forward. Uh, many of these priorities have already been put into place by Core Center and their patient-centered approach, really engaging the lessons learned from their research arm into their clinical practice and never forgetting the importance of peer navigation and, and advocacy from the community. Addressing disparities in care and treating clients along their entire lifespan remains a key priority for IDPH and my office. Uh, CORE remains a, nation, a national leader in this area, and one area that we take tremendous pride in is their work with women of childbearing age. Gender neutrality and connection to the LGBT communities also remains a priority for CORE. The voices of these communities continue to drive initiatives, priority setting, and service delivery for CORE's mission and services. So in looking at the future, IDPH draws a lot of inspiration from stakeholders and partners such as Core Center. Their programs truly are best practice and exemplify the most important components of Core's mission, service delivery with humanity. As mentioned earlier, IDPH is excited to embark on a CMS affinity project with our friends at Medicaid. This partnership will lead a project to assess themes of formulary expansion, cost savings, and timely data sharing. Specifically, we will be performing matching analyses with both Ryan White and Medicaid data sets to identify areas for system improvement and ensure consistency in meeting HIV standards of care, regardless of payer source. 
as IDPH moves forward with our city and county HIV leadership on our Getting to Zero framework, which is geared to developing and supporting programs and investing in infrastructure that gets Illinois closer to zero new infections of HIV, we maintain that CORE and their leadership will continue to be a big part of this endeavor and this framework development given their leadership and expertise. Um, we are always looking for creative opportunities to ensure we are reaching all those that need PrEP, for example, and much like our philosophy about public health in general, our department values that PrEP is a fundamental right, never a privilege, regardless of a client's ability to pay for this. Therefore, the state has committed to ensuring that we will continue to remain the payer of last resort for anyone in the state who is in need of PrEP medication or services. And finally, we will continue our partnership with Core Center to address harm reduction and the opioid epidemic, which we all know is not new to Chicago, Illinois, or really the nation, but finally receiving the attention, momentum, and resources needed to address it. Through all of these initiatives, we look forward to working with CORE and our other leading stakeholders and establishing priorities and developing successful programs. And with this, I thank you all for your time and your ongoing passion. IDPH measures our success and our ability to support all of you and the tremendous work that you do. So carry on. Thank you. And we look forward to continuing to partner in the future. And that's my email address. If anyone needs to contact me directly, this doesn't go to secretary. It comes to my inbox. I live with my cell phone in my hand. And I'm, again, I'm always open to hearing from you and learning about new opportunities, creative ways of doing business. But be prepared. One of the first things that I will ask you if you come to me with a problem or challenge is, is how have you thought to rectify the situation, and it really does engage all of the great minds at the table. And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Uh, this is Marissa again with Health HIV. I just wanted to open up um, the discussion for any questions. You can use the chat box at the bottom left um, to type in your questions and uh, we will try to answer them in order uh, that they come in. Um, before we start doing that and while people are thinking about their questions, I do have one uh, first initial question that I just wanted to pose uh, to the folks at the core center and also Eduardo too if you want to weigh in on this. If another state or another health system was thinking about doing what you're doing, creating a one-stop shopping center like the core center um, or implementing some policies to support the creation of this type of a center, what's kind of the big advice that you would give them in doing so um, and how and what's kind of a first step that they might take um, to get this movement going? This is Eduardo, and I'll go ahead and start with something brief and let you know our leadership at the core center chime in. And that is, I am constantly reminding agencies and stakeholders of the value and importance in diversifying their, their fiscal infrastructure. And I know that I sound like I work for you know, a, a finance institution, and I apologize for that. But now more than ever, we have to think about sustainability and infrastructure development. And the Core Center has been such an exemplary best practice in not relying on one particular pocket of money, be they prevention dollars or Ryan White dollars. They have very thoughtfully constructed a network of resources, and it hasn't been easy, but they have, they have compiled and connected different payer sources and resources so that in the event of a cut to one program, they are not without an opportunity to deliver those services. And it's a strategy that I think is one of the successful tenants of any of these one-stop shopping models, but even more so a, a really critical part and priority of how we should be developing our programs moving forward. Awesome, Eduardo. Uh, continuing, you know, from a nurse's perspective, so not the big picture, but at the bedside, you know, uh, the delivery system has to center on the client's needs. 
Uh, it's got a render care across disciplines and um, specialties attending not only to the medical needs but also those other key factors that impact care, you know, such as financial, um, any, you know, involvement with the justice system, uh, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. Uh, and the system must be fluid, so it's got to change. I think one thing the Corps has been really good about is changing and morphing over time to accommodate the current needs of our clients. Um, also, you know, engaging in the plan of care um, is in its execution with the staff and, you know, with the peers, especially with, with our patients to get their input. Um, that's why, you know, I think they're, that is so um, critical to our success. Um, lastly, though, I have to say structured partnerships, you know, such as we have with Eduardo Alvarado and IDPH, you know, I can tell you from the bedside, again, from my perspective, what a difference it made for you guys to step in and make um, um, hepatitis treatment meds available for our co-infected patients that didn't have stage three and four cirrhosis. You know, so many of our patients had, their insurance would not cover them until they had advanced disease. And here we're so worried about our patients, you know, co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C. We think it's the hepatitis that's likely going to kill them. So, I, you know, at, again, at the bedside, I had patients saying to me, what, I have to get sicker before I get treatment? But now, you know, thanks to the collaboration again with um, Mr. Um, Alvarado and IDPH, he has made those drugs available to us at stage one and two so that we can get on this and cure people and they can move on and live, you know, fruitful lives. So again, my perspective is more, you know, at the bedside, but I, I see such an impact that we had thanks to our collaboration with IDPH. And can I share from a social service standpoint, um, the clients are your eyes and your and, 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 and their ears to what they need and want. I remember uh, back in the 90s when we started, they needed so much and we had so little to offer in terms of social service. So what we did is we utilized those surrounding us from um, a service delivery. So. You know, when we brought in the heating assistance program, when we brought in someone that does free phones, when we brought in legal aid, social security, if you bring on all those services, and it's not a lot once a week, maybe once every other uh, week, that brings in the clients so I could get more than one item taken care of while I'm coming to clinic. Additionally, we started asking for resources that were needed, something as simple as a bus card. When someone does not have transportation, that's crucial to getting them to and from their clinic appointments. So we have, we have to listen and hear them. Even if it's a complaint, it's uncomfortable, but they're telling you a need that's not being taken care of. It's up to us to address that particular needs because I'm sure the one that doesn't tell you has the same problem. Great, thank you all so much. That was a, a great response to that question. I, I particularly think what you just mentioned there um, around utilizing your partners in the community first to start building this one-stop shopping center uh, like the core center is really great as well and having such a strong um, partnership with the health department is essential. Um, before we close out, I just wanted to ask um, one more question because uh, I think people are still engaged and on the phone. As you're looking at, you know, we're going into a new administration, um, health care reform is, has been dynamic and, and may continue to change. How are you positioning yourself at the core center to address any new needs that might come up um, or any changes that might need to be made as a result? Well, you know, uh, clients are availed if they, they lose their health care um, through the Affordable Care Act. We have CareLink here where through the county system it gets paid. My concern, uh, great concern, is the clients that we service that are undocumented, um, we are hearing, they're panicking. 
Um, are they going to be targeted? I don't know. Um, we in social service do think, where does the information go? So in these venues of meetings, I am their eyes and ears also. So I will ask, what do you do with this information? Is this going to get to INS? I need to hear it so that we could come back and share with our clients, this isn't going anywhere. Because we will see a reduction of, of health care um, clients coming in because they are afraid of what's going on there. And that's the topic that we're hearing right now that we have to address. In terms of the needs, they are welcome to come here with or without insurance. Our job is to get them on ADAP, which IDPH is great with, or um, getting them um, insured through the county system, Cook County Health and Hospital System. This is Eduardo, and thank you for that. And it's, it's hard, I, I know we have to navigate through the lens of, of political correctiveness at times, but the one thing that we are adamant about here in the section and the state's perspective is we will continue to be the safety net for all of those that need care in and within Illinois. And one of the things that we need to continue doing aggressively is to, again, not put all of our, our eggs in one basket, but to really ensure we have contingency plans and backup plans. And first and foremost, the message to my staff that's being dictated through every part of their daily experience in enrolling clients for these life extending services is you do not, con you do not stop enrolling, you enroll quickly, aggressively, thoughtfully, you continue doing that. And we know that change uh, doesn't happen overnight, and we also know that there are opportunities within our payer sources that allow us to, again, continue to support as payer of last resort. So one of the things that has become a growing priority for us within the state is duly enrolling clients where possible for not just one, but as many insurance uh, payer sources as possible. So for those clients that are on Medicaid, for example, to duly enroll them in the state and federal Ryan White and ADAP services. There are reasons for this. It makes perfect sense. This is a very allowable thing, and it ensures that we are not putting the life of these clients within one payer source. And so that's something that I encourage all of you to continue doing is to really look at all of the eligible platforms for paying for these services that we can and where possible duly enroll them. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Eduardo, Carmen, Becky, um, for your perspective and for sharing such a great story and a great model that is the core center. Um, we're going to close out the webinar today as it's a few minutes past four, um, but I just wanted to point out to everyone that's on the webinar still, uh, please uh, go ahead and access our SurveyMonkey link to fill out the webinar evaluation. It's very helpful for us in improving and continuing um, to produce uh, webinars and online curriculum that is impactful and relevant to you as attendees. Um, you may also see on the announcement on the slide right now, there is a link to access the final PDF of the slide. Um, and there's also a link to where the slides uh, recordings, um, the PDF and Q&A will be at the end um, there as well. It's on Health HIV's website. We'll be posting the recording about 24 hours to 48 hours after the webinar. So if it's not there by the end of the day Friday, it'll be there by the end of the day um, on Monday. And again, just want to thank everyone um, for attending the webinar. Um, we really appreciate your participation and your engagement. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can contact Shana Linup. She's our training coordinator uh, at Health HIV at Shana at healthhiv.org, or Kiara Corso. She's with NASHP um, and also co-facilitated this um, at ccorso at nashp.org if you have any additional questions. So again, just want to thank you all for participating. Um, you may go to Health HIV's website for more training opportunities, online training, and in person. Um, and also, NASHP has a wealth of resources on state health policy, so please access that.
Um, any final questions, shoot us in the chat box. Um, and without uh, further ado, I just want to thank all of our presenters again um, and our wonderful uh, colleagues at Nash PR and others for participating today. Um, and want to thank everyone for uh, being in attendance and being engaged. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. You as well. <laughs>